Welcome everyone to the Unitarian Church of Los Alamos, whoever you are, wherever you are on your life's journey, whatever you believe and whomever you love, you are welcome here. This is the Biblical Scholarship and Literacy class. Uh, this is our 28th lecture. Um, then we will do the conclusion to the book of Numbers. We'll specifically talk about water from the stone and the story of the brazen serpent found in the book of Numbers. I want to remind everyone that there is a syllabus. I keep links to all the different lectures there, um, as well as um, links to uh, additional material, uh, reading material, that sort of thing. Uh, there's also a calendar. Uh, I struggle to keep up, but I will try to keep the calendar updated so you know when the next class is, especially next month. I'm not sure because I'm going to be on travel. I'm not sure exactly when the next class is, so I'll try to put that on the calendar and let you know as soon as I get that figured out. So today, what we want to cover today is we want to review the, the book of Numbers, the things we've discussed uh, before, and then we're going to add these two stories, specifically the water from the rock and the brazen serpent. And we're going to try to do what we like to do here, which is show what those stories mean in kind of the context of the ancient Near East and the people who, uh, who would have told those stories and where they came from and kind of what they might have meant to them. And so we're going to try to put that stuff in context. Now, there's several different ways you can outline the book of Numbers. Uh, we went through this last time, but um, you can. You can uh, skip it by generation, and if you divide it by generation, there are two parts to the book, 1 through 25, the first generation, or 26 through 36 is the story of the second generation. You can also divide it into thirds by location, specifically the location of Sinai, which is in the first part, and the second part is the wilderness journey, and then the third part is what happens in the plains of Moab as they get ready to enter the promised land. And this includes kind of the conquest of the east side of the River Jordan. Uh, or you can divide it up by key events like the holy, uh, holiness in the camp, holiness in the tabernacle, the departure from Sinai, the rebellion and death in the wilderness, um, and then threats on the plains of Moab, fighting the Midianites and, uh, and the kind of genocide of the Midianites on the east side of the River Jordan, and then the preparation for entering the Promised Land. So there's lots of different ways you can kind of split this story up. So, and where in there does Moses die? Moses dies at the very end. Well, so um, the book of Deuteronomy also takes place here on, 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 the, uh, on the east bank, just before crossing the River Jordan into the Promised Land. And Moses dies after the book of Deuteronomy. And so what happens is the book of Numbers gets us here, and then the book of Deuteronomy is presumably a talk Moses gave after they got there. So the book of Numbers completes all the kind of story, and then there's this speech Moses gives, and then they enter the promised land, and Moses dies just before they go in at the end of Deuteronomy, and then, then we get to Joshua in the promised land. But you can also divide it up by detail. I don't expect you to be able to to um, <coughs> read all this and, and see it all, but um, this is a more detailed version of this. I will put this uh, in the in the video description as a and in the syllabus as kind of a handout, so you could print this sort of um, list of the stories and what verses they're in, so you can get in, you can see where all the different stories take place. So to review quickly, I'm just going to give like one sentence of each of the each of the topics we've discussed from the book of Numbers, so you remember what's in here. First, we had the organization of the camp. We talked about all the different tribes, how we ended up with 13 tribes, and how they divided into 12, and how the Levites march and everything. And we talked about how this was important to the author of P. We talked about the, the ritual for the purity law of jealousy. This is where a man thinks his wife has maybe committed adultery. And, uh, and, and so he brings her to the tabernacle, and she drinks this concoction. You remember the story. And we talked about its implications for, uh, for uh, abortion rules. And we specifically said that um, it would be nice if, if kind of both sides of that debate stopped proof texting. Because this story, although it can be interpreted as being about a divinely inspired abortion that happens because the woman has been unfaithful, it can also be interpreted as divinely imposed inf uh, infertility, and the Hebrew is, is ambiguous. And this is true of most of the passages. And so if we want to address the abortion debate, we need to talk about theology and about um, philosophy and about ethics and some of these other issues um, that are much more equipped to deal with the problem than kind of proof texting from the text. So that was what we talked about in, uh, in this uh, Numbers 5. 
We also mentioned the priestly benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift up his countenance to shine upon you come out from within you and give you peace. And we talked about how we have these ancient amulets, which are the oldest kind of attested text that is also found in the Bible. We talked about the difficulties in interpreting this. Uh, some people have said that the, these amulets are quoting from the Bible, but that's not clear. All that we know is that both the Bible and these amulets have this priestly benediction. It does mean, though, that the priestly benediction found in the Bible is old, but it could be quoting from an earlier tradition, right? So both of these could be quoting from an earlier tradition. It doesn't help us date the biblical text, but it is this very old reference to something that we also find in the Bible. We then told the story of um, Balaam and his talking donkey. This is one of my favorite stories in the entire uh, entire Bible. It's on one of only the two times that an animal speaks. The other is in Genesis uh, in the fall in chapter, I think, four. Um, and so, uh, you know, we also, what, what I, one of the things I thought was most interesting was, you know, the way Balaam just assumes that his donkey can talk. He's not even surprised by it. Um, that makes for a great story. But also this reference to several uh, inscriptions describing this individual. Uh, Balaam, son of Beor, is found in several inscriptions, and so he seems to be uh, from non-Israelite sources, I, I may add, and they're fairly old. So uh, this seems to be kind of a famous character, almost like Gilgamesh. Uh, so what we probably have is this famous uh, character who um, the Bible brings into its story and says, even the famous character, you know, that, that was so known for, for giving blessings, blessed Israel, and that's why Israel is so great, right? So it has kind of political, later political implications in how it's applied. Uh, and then we talked briefly, and I said we were going to cover this again in greater detail, but I don't, I don't, I, looking back, I don't see a reason. I think we actually covered it, and that is the conquest, the conquest is found mostly in Joshua, that's where we uh, associate it with, but it begins in the book of Numbers, because in the book of Numbers, they conquer the east side of Jordan. So the story of the conquest really begins in Joshua. We will talk about it again when we get to Numbers, but the important points were all brought up last time, and that is, we don't believe this is historical. It probably never happened. Uh, the, 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 the area on the east side of Jordan was sparsely populated. There wouldn't the description of these cities that are destroyed and these nations that are destroyed are anachronistic. Uh, they're a description of later time. Um, and so it probably is not historical, probably didn't happen, at least didn't happen this way. Uh, so Israel was never actually commanded by God to, to, to commit genocide against all these people because they never actually committed genocide against all these people. It, it didn't, didn't happen. So A, the history says it didn't happen. But the other thing that's important is how do we deal with the fact that the biblical authors describe a God of such violence? And so we did discuss that last time. We just said, look, this is, this is a, a, a God seen through the lens of people who were constantly at war, constantly being killed. And what they wanted out of a God was a God who was powerful enough to protect them and to scare away their enemies. And the, the Assyrians were well known for kind of, when they would conquer a city, they would take big poles and they would take the people and impale them on these stakes and leave them there to slowly, slowly die. And what are they doing? They're trying to produce so much terror that no one will dare fight against them. And that sort of propaganda, it was common in the ancient East where people would pretend that they were more violent than they really were. Right? In modern wars, people pretend they didn't commit atrocities because they want international you know, support. And in the ancient world, people pretended they committed atrocities that they never actually committed in order to scare people off so that they could win wars by terror, alone by people be afraid of them. So this is, this is sort of the context in which these stories were written. And they probably didn't actually happen. It certainly didn't happen the way the text describes. I also just think that uh, peop this is the other point we made. And I think this one is key. People who defend biblical inerrancy at the cost of God's character are doing something that I think is problematic. Right? If you want to defend biblical iner inerrancy and you're willing to defend it at the cost of Im imposing absolutely horrific genocidal uh, tendencies to the deity, well, I, I, I find that to be problematic, right? So we don't want to defend, I think, biblical inerrancy at the cost of God's character. So today, today we're going to add these two stories to the mix, um, right? The, um, the, the water from the rock and the, um, the brazen serpent.
And that'll be our goal for today. So the pattern of complaint and intercession. This is something that happens all throughout the, the text of, of, of Numbers and Exodus, especially. Exodus and Numbers are full of this pattern. It happens over and over again. And it goes something like this. The people complain, they rebel, or they worship idols, or they do something else remarkably stupid. After God saved them from Egypt and did all these things for them, the people do something remarkably stupid. God becomes angry with them, so the people suffer or are punished or they die because God is mad at them. The people repent and they ask Moses or, or sometimes Aaron for help. And Moses and Aaron then go to God and intercede on the people's behalf and say, you know, the people I know they're, they're bad, but, you know, please be nice to them. And, and God's mind is changed because of the intercession of Moses and Aaron. And then a divine miracle happens and the people are saved. So, a few examples. Uh, we get manna in the wilderness. Uh, we get quail in the wilderness. We get, remember the quail story? The people ask for food and God sends so many quail that the people eat too much and, and, and it starts to rot and stuff. We get the golden calf. We get this strange fire, water from the rock, poisonous serpents. So the, both the water from the rock and the poisonous serpents are going to be examples of this pattern, which is why we're bringing it up. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the entire chapter is kind of a commentary on this pattern, doing bad things, uh, Bad things happen in response, then you repent, then Moses intercedes. Only in, in Corinthians, it's Jesus who intercedes. He sees this whole thing as a pattern of Jesus and salvation. And then God forgives you through a miracle, and you're saved. So what's behind these stories? What, where do they come from? Well, I believe there are at least two competing foundations or memories or ideologies or concepts that are at war here. And when you try to combine them, the pattern of complaint and intercession is one way to harmonize these two competing impulses. The first is that the path through the wilderness was really difficult, so a lot of us died. Aren't you glad we've made it to the promised land? Because we went through this whole difficult thing. The other impulse is that God was with us and he protected us. But if God was with you and protected you, why did so many people die? And the answer is, well, the people died because they were doing these horrible things. So God punished them. That's why they died. But as soon as the people repented, God protected us by miracle. And this impulse is, is natural to humans. I mean, the, the, um, the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, love to tell these stories about how God protected them as they crossed the plains to, to their Utah promised land as they, were, as they left. The, the, and they, they, so they have the same sort of impulse. God protected us, God took care of us. Look at all the miracles that happened as we traveled. So again, I think that these impulses explain this pattern in part. Um, the pattern is also a life's lesson. Did, did, don't do the dumb things they did, be better than them because when they did these dumb things, they were punished. Instead, trust in God who saves us by mighty miracles. And that's why we have miracles like the water from the rock and the healing of people bitten by serpents uh, by the raising of the brazen serpent, which we will now uh, discuss those in detail. So let's talk about the water from the rock. This is a picture of the event. If you remember the story, Moses came and he hit a rock. And most people know this story, right? Moses came, he hit a rock, water came out of the rock, and the people drank, and that's how they had water in the wilderness. You've heard that story before. In one version of the story, Moses came, he was supposed to speak to the rock, but instead he hit the rock, water came out anyway, the people drank, and God got mad, and that's why Moses didn't get to go into the promised land. Those are the, the two versions of the stories you probably heard. And they sound kind of contradictory, and they are. And the reason you've heard both versions of those stories is because both versions are in the Bible. One of them is in Numbers. The other is in Exodus. So here's the story from Exodus chapter 17. Uh, the first is uh, ascribed to the redactor. The redactor is the person who put all these earlier sources together. So this is kind of commentary to, to make the pieces fit together. The redactor says, from the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation uh, of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded, and they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Then, we, then he inserts uh, information from the e-source. You remember the e-source is probably from northern Israel and is probably descended from priests who traced their lineage to Moses. So these are the Moshite priests, we call them. And that's probably the origin, kind of the E tradition or source. And so from E we get, the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the, peop 
well, because they were thirsty. Anyway, uh, but the people thir thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and the livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord. So now we're in the intercession part, right? So Moses cried out to the Lord and said, what shall I do for this people? They're almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go and I will be standing there in front of you in the rock at Horeb. Uh, Horeb is, is E's name for Mount Sinai. Strike the rock. So the people are behind, right? But Moses goes off to Mount Sinai. You'll notice the rock is at Mount Sinai. That's interesting. Uh, strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. And Moses did notice here Moses is commanded to strike the rock. Uh, so Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the, the place uh, Massah and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and, and tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? Uh, so the people wanted to know if the Lord was with them because they were dying of thirst, and this proves that the Lord was with them because water appeared at Mount Sinai uh, when Moses struck the rock. That's the version from E in Exodus 17. But this is the version we get uh, from P. Now, you notice P is, a, is traditionally assumed to be a descendant of Aaron, and you'll see why we think that in this text. This, these two texts, I believe, are very instructive for seeing the difference between E and P, and for understanding why we believe there are two versions, uh, two uh, sources at work here. So again, the redactor, the Israelites, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh. This is after Mount Sinai. They have left Mount Sinai and gone back to the wilderness of Sin. So on the other one, they're in the wilderness of Sin, and, in other words, Sinai probably, and they go to Mount, and Moses goes ahead to Mount Sinai, hits a rock, and the rock is at Mount Sinai. In this one, they're at this place in the wilderness instead, and there Miriam died and was buried. Now, therefore, there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and against Aaron. Notice the reference to Aaron. He didn't mention Aaron at all, <coughs> but suddenly Aaron is here, and the people quarreled with Moses and said, would that we had died when our kindred died before the Lord. Why have you brought this assembly of the Lord into the wilderness for us and our livestock to die here? Both mention livestock. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to bring us to, the, to this wretched place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went away from the assembly and to the entrance of the tent of meeting, in other words, the tabernacle. He didn't mention the tabernacle, but for P, what do you do when you want to go talk to God? You go to the temple. And they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. That reference, glory of the Lord, is a common P, uh, P term. And then the Lord said, spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and your brother Aaron. Notice Aaron's supposed to go with him. Aaron is part of the solution here. And command the rock before their eyes to yield its water. Thus you shall bring water out of the rock for them, and thus you shall provide drink for the congregation and their livestock. So Moses... Uh, took the staff before the Lord and as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, listen, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Notice, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? So for, from P's perspective, from E's perspective, Moses is a hero. And he's bringing water out of the rock and that's what God wants. In P's narrative, God is the hero and Moses is overstepping his bounds here by saying, shall we bring water out of this rock for you? Um, and then Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff. According to tradition, the first time it gushes forth blood and the second time water. This is an old later Jewish tradition to, to explain that it struck twice. Uh, and water came out abundantly. Notice God still gives them the water even though Moses is doing this wrong. He's specifically not doing what he was told to do. And the congregation and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust in me to show your holiness before the eyes of the Israelites, um, to show my holiness, sorry, you didn't trust in me to show my holiness. In other words, you, took, you were trying to take it on yourself, like you were the one bringing the water instead of showing that it was me. Um, before the eyes of the Israelites, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord um, through which he showed himself to be holy. This is P's account. Um, the way the story is told, put together this way, what happens is Moses brings water from the rock twice, once 
once at Mount Sinai, just before they get there, and once after in the wilderness. Uh, and, but, but the stories both reference the place name, Meribah. And so what's probably happening, Meribah means to quarrel, right? So the, the, you, this, I call this place Meribah because you quarreled with the Lord here. What is probably happening is we have a, a mythical story designed to t explain the reason certain places are named the way they are. There's a place named Quarrel, so they have to have an account of what Quarrel happened here to explain the place name. And so this, this myth, this, this cultural idea of the, the Israelites quarreling with the Lord in this place was older than both of the sources. That's why both P and E have, a, have an account of it. It's an old story. But because they have different traditions, they each have a slightly different version of the story. They differ in when it happened. They differ in some of the details. And uh, the redactor puts it together and just explains to us, well, it happened twice. But because of the repetition, especially of the name, and because of the details that repeat, it's almost certain that really this is two accounts of the same myth or idea rather than an event that happened twice. It also just doesn't make sense for God to command Moses to speak to the rock the second time where the first time God actually commanded him to hit the rock. That doesn't make sense. It does make sense though that, that these two different accounts might differ in how it was supposed to happen in some of these details. That makes sense. Okay, uh, so what I've done here is I put up the parallels to help you see why this is probably two accounts of the same story. One is before Sinai, one is after. The people quarrel with Moses. The people complain against Moses or they gather against Moses and Aaron. You can see the difference. Moses cried to the Lord. Moses and Aaron went to the entrance of the tent of meeting. One, Moses and Aaron just pray. The other, they go to the entrance of the tent of meeting and there they pray. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. That's a P only. Makes sense. This is P's Peace calling card, one of them. Uh, Moses uh, was commanded to strike the rock. In the other, he's commanded to speak to the rock. But in both, he strikes the rock. Once, he strikes it twice. In the other, he just strikes it once, I think. And then Moses is vindicated before the people. And the other one, Moses is punished by the Lord. And then in both of them, this is the, the waters of Meribah. Now, uh, again, not only can you see, I think, evidence of two sources here, it's really illustrative of the difference. Specifically, their approach to Aaron and their approach to Moses. Because these are two different priestly traditions who were in competition during the, er the early time of Israel's history. These are groups of people with socioeconomic and, and political differences. And they both have accounts of this story, but each of them spins it to support their uh, position. One uses it to turn Moses into a hero. One uses it to kind of complain about Moses and, and his failings. This is the same thing we see in the golden calf story. For E, Aaron totally messes up. So that's why he has this golden calf story. Right? Because E is a Mosite priest. And so for him, he's got to complain about, about the failings of Aaron. We see the exact opposite when P tells a story. Moses will do things that are wrong and Aaron will be the hero. Okay. So what's happening, let's try to think about some of the theological and ritual implications of the water from the rock. In E's account, it happens at Sinai, and for P, it's about bringing the water with them into the wilderness. <clears throat> um, you can think of Mount Sinai, or you can think of the ta tabernacle itself as a scale model of Mount Sinai. And so, or, or you can think of Mount Sinai as an attempt to to uh, turn the tabernacle into a, into a mythical story. Uh, but they have a, a long list of, of parallel elements, and one of them is this, this uh, sacred water. In the tabernacle, the sacred water is brought in this bronze laver, and it's used for washing. But the fact of this water, one of, the, one of its purposes is to show that the Israelites are taking the sacred water of God with them into the wilderness. Uh, just like they're taking the cloud with them when they in the incense altar. The incense altar would create smoke before the veil and that let them bring the cloud and the pillar of fire with them into the wilderness. So this is an attempt to take the burning bush and the menorah to take God with you in the wilderness. 
So let's talk about how this story is, is interpreted. Philo is a Greek uh, scholar. He's a Greek Jew, and he's interested in defending Judaism to the Greek people who are, who are big into philosophy. And so for them, these myths are kind of embarrassing. And so he, he creates a, a, a lot of philosophical reinterpretations of the myths to make them uh, more palpable to philosophers. And so, for example, he equates the rock with wisdom uh, and the manna with the divine logos or word. This is exactly what we then see later in the book of John, who will do the same thing. He will equate the divine word with Jesus in the bread of life sermon, where Jesus talks about how I am the bread of life. I am the logos. Jesus is the word. So what is the logos? The logos is this philosophical concept in ancient Greek philosophy that it is the intelligent or... Um, well, it's very difficult to summarize because it, it can be viewed in many different ways. So any summary I give will be a failure. But it, you can think of it as the intelligent property of the universe, the divine spark, therefore, that, that, or the first cause, or any of those sorts of things. And so Jesus is, in the beginning, was the word, Jesus, the intelligent principle. Um, so, again, uh, he's interpreting this rock as wisdom and uh, the manna in the wilderness as the logos. In Pseudophilo, uh, who, uh, and again, I, I'm not an expert here, I believe Pseudophilo is a uh, uh, later text that was attributed to Philo, but probably wasn't actually written by him. But he says, the water of Merah became sweet. This is a different story which we, we, uh, than the one at Meribah, but similar sounding words, right? And also a story about water. But in this case, he says, and it, the well of the water, followed them in the wilderness for 40 years and went up to the mountain with them and went down into the plains. This uh, well follows them, and it follows them in the form of a stone. So for him, three stories are combined. The turning the, wa the bitter water sweet at Meribah, and then the stone that follows them that becomes a spring out of which these waters flow, and it follows them into the wilderness. This is from the first century AD, so around the time of, of Christian, uh, that Christianity was beginning to form. We also have later texts from, Jew, from Jewish traditions called the Targum. Targum are um, basically, a, a, did you, I don't know if you know this, but um, uh, um, Charles Dickens retold a story of the life of Christ in his own words. So the Targum is kind of a retelling of the book of Moses in uh, the person's own words, and there were a bunch of these uh, from, early, from early Judaism. And it, they would use this as an opportunity to address complicated passages, to give their theological opinion about things that were, were you know, up in the air or whatever. So you would get kind of a, a retelling of the biblical story loosely, often with uh, additions and commentary and thoughts, their thoughts on how this probably happened. Um, it was a very common tradition. There are a bunch of these targums that exist. But in one of them, we have um, the well, which was with Israel in the wilderness, was like a rock of the size of uh, Cabra, I don't know what that is, and was oozing out and rising as from the mouth of a flask, traveling with them up to the mountains and going down with them to the valleys. This sounds a lot like what, what Philo uh, said, or Pseudophilo said. Um, this tradition that the rock followed them, what is going on here? Well, there are two stories of the rock, and these Jewish commentators noticed how similar they were, and they were both called Mirabah. And so one of the interpretations late Jewish authors had of this event, we know that it really came from multiple sources. The redactor puts it in as if it happened twice. These later Jewish commentators say, yes, but it's still confusing. And so for them, what happened is the, the rock must have rolled around with, with the Israelites in the wilderness, or they carried it or something. The rock went with them. And what's really happening is Moses is just bringing forth water out of the rock multiple times as they bring this rock with them or the rock follows them. And usually the rock follows them because the rock is supposed to be just like the pillar of, of fire. God went with them in a pillar of fire and a cloud and a rock. And, and this is God's presence following them and providing them with light and direction and sustenance, the bread of life, the manna, and the water of life from the rock. And all these things are God's presence or evidence of God's presence following them through the wilderness. Which leads us to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I do not want you to be ignorant, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and passed through the sea, and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and the sea. He's talking about the same thing, God with them in the cloud of, in the fire. And they ate the same spiritual food. Now he's talking about the manna. 
another sign of God's presence with them. And they drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock is Christ. So what do we know about Paul? Paul was uh, trained a Pharisee. He says so uh, in the most traditional uh, sect. So uh, Christian apologists who want to defend biblical inerrancy have tried to say, well, there's no real evidence that, that this idea of the rock following them was old enough for Paul to be quoting from that tradition because a lot of the references we have to it are from the third century or the first century AD. The problem with that is, well, you really think Paul came up with this idea and then Philo is you know, quoting Paul? I mean, that, that doesn't make sense. Uh, Paul is a Pharisee who is converted to Christianity. Paul is, if you, even if you think, right, that Paul didn't get it from these other authors, Paul is then a witness that this tradition is old. That's all it takes. Like Paul is a witness that this Jewish tradition, which we have attested from later sources, was old enough that they share it. And so even if you think Paul came before these other sources, it doesn't matter. Paul himself is a witness of this early Jewish tradition because Paul believes it. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and they were struck down in the wilderness. This is, again, that, that um, idea of, of the complaining and then the intercession and the saving uh, coming in a cycle. Paul himself is referring to that cycle we started with here. Yeah, go ahead. It seems unusually easy to get crosswise with God. You know, I'm dying of thirst, I'm dying of thirst. Well, shut up, you complainer. That's right. I mean, uh, uh, if you die of thirst God com and complain, God gets mad at you, but... But I think there's reason to complain if you're dying of thirst. Uh, so it, this, this portrayal of God is, is very easily angered. <clears throat> but again, I, I think some of the impetus for this came from these, this, this, these competing issues, right? A lot of us died to get here. It was a difficult journey, but now we're in the promised land. Isn't that great? God protected us along the way. Well, if he protected us, why did so many of us die? And why was it so hard? Well, because the people complained, and then they got in trouble, and then God saved them. But the salvation is the point. It's miraculous. Isn't it great that God takes care of us as we travel through the wilderness? Look at the water from the rock. Therefore, God is on our side. This is, this is kind of the, 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 um, the point of the, of the story. God is on our side. He helped us. All you have to do is trust in him and stop complaining. So anyway, but Paul is doing the same thing. Now, what's interesting to me here is I think... This story is a beautiful illustration of multiple sources. You can see P and E in them. Of the difference between the two sources, you can see the difference in word usage. You can see the difference in, in philosophy, in background, in emphasis. Uh, one from Moses, uh, Moses' descendants, one from Aaron's descendants. It's all very clear. And then you see these later traditions about trying to deal with the fact that there are two stories and how to combine them. And the redactor does it slightly different than the later Jews do it with the rock following them. And then you can see Paul referencing these later traditions of which he is a part. And there's nothing wrong with that. We can use parables from our day and our life to make points. Uh, but if you are a biblical inerrantist, then and only then this becomes a problem. Because suddenly Paul is referencing something, an event, which is part of the tradition of his day, but which we know is not the original and earliest source of the material and text that we have. Right? The, the idea that the rock followed him is all based on trying to reconcile these two accounts. That's it. Not, there's no evidence in the text that it really happened, that it really followed this way, it didn't come from this source, and yet Paul uh, uh, talks about it as if it did. And again, that is not a problem unless you believe in biblical perfection in inerrancy, but if you understand that these people are talking from their own time, from their own day, according to their own understanding of these stories, instead of giving us absolute truth about what happened in the past, then, then this becomes difficult for you to deal with. So that's our first story. It's why I told it. I thought it was very informative, uh, specifically in what it tells us about the nature of the biblical texts, where they came from, and, and these issues of inerrancy. And they're very illustrative of the documentary hypothesis and why the evidence for it is really so strong. Let's talk about the brazen serpent now. This is another of those stories where the people sin, they have problems, they cry to Moses, Moses comes to God, and a miracle saves them. Specifically, in this case, <clears throat> 
they're bitten by serpents and saved by a miraculous uh, pole, that if they look to the pole, uh, they are healed from the serpent bites and they miraculously are healed. So let's read the story. From Mount Hor, they set down out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Does this sound familiar? Um, by the way, this is E's story. For there's no food and no water. And um, we detest this miserable food. Now, this one is the manna. We detest the manna. The manna is so nasty. We've been eating manna. Can you imagine, though? I understand why they say this sort of thing. It's this great miracle from God that they have food at all. But instead of being grateful for it, they get sick of it because they eat the same thing every day over and over. It gets, it gets old, no matter how good the food was. Um, so we detest this food. And the Lord, again, just like you said, God here is really easy to tick off, right? God sent poisonous seraphs. Poisonous, uh, the, the word poisonous here is, is from seraph. Uh, seraph literally means fiery. Uh, it, but it probably is best translated in this context as poisonous because it bites the people and they, they get a fever. So it's, it's a fiery bite. Uh, but, but it's important, I think, to go back to the root of this word because there will be later word plays that depend on understanding it. So I could have just translated it poisonous, but then you would miss, I think, some of the later things that happen. So it's a fiery serpent among the people. And they bit the people and many of the Israelites died. So the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away these serpents from us. So Moses, again, exactly the pattern we saw last time, right? Problem, the Israelites do something bad. God punishes them. The Israelites come to Moses and say, please fix it. Moses comes to God and a miracle happens. And the miracle becomes proof that God is with the people and guiding them to the promised land. So Moses prayed for the people and the Lord said to Moses, make a, a, a seraph ser serpent, a, a fiery serpent. Now in this case, I think poisonous is not the right translation because this is something he puts up on a pole. I think here fiery refers to uh, bright, shining, right? You, you make this brass thing, you put it up on a pole and the sun shines off it and, it and it shines bright. This is a bright, shining, fiery serpent and set it on a pole and everyone that is bitten shall look at it and live. So there's the pun. The fiery serpents is the poison and the, the bright, shining serpent on the pole is the solution. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and here there's another great Hebrew wordplay, uh, Nahash, Nahoshet, uh, a serpent of bronze. Uh, so those two words sound alike in Hebrew. So there's kind of this, this word pun rhyming thing going on. And put it on a pole. And whosoever is bitten by uh, someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and they will live. So this is, this is, this is a, a path to, to living through serpent bite. So it's a cure for serpent bite. Uh, in the context of the ancient Near East, this is not an unusual sort of cure for serpent bite. Uh, this is the sort of thing we see, and I'll show you some examples a little bit later. But first, let's, let's, uh, let's go to 2 Kings 18, because we have more information about this serpent that Moses put on a pole. And this is about Hezekiah. He, Hezekiah, removed the high places. High places are temples other than Jer the temple in Jerusalem. So there's this later idea that is especially espoused by Deuteron Deuteronomic sources. We'll talk about this when we get to the book of Deuteronomy next class. Um, that you can only worship God at the temple in Jerusalem. But that is not a universally held belief. And so uh, this was an attempt, I think, at kind of almost a power grab. They're trying to centralize worship in Jerusalem where the priests, the Aaronic priests, the people who wrote the book of B, can be in control of the worship. And so uh, Hezekiah goes and he shut, and now I, I should give some, some detail here, background. Um, Hezekiah is being invaded by the Assyrians. And these are actions he takes uh, to bring God's favor so that God will um, support him in his uh, coming war with the Assyrians. Uh, I should also add that at this point, we are in the historical section of the biblical text. We know that Hezekiah was a real person. We have references to him in inscriptions from the time found in archaeological digs, not just randomly by random people where they could be forged. These were uh, found by reputable uh, scholars doing, during their archaeological digs. Um, so we have his, his seals. He's very common copies of his, his signet seals. Um, and we have Assyrian references 
to both Hezekiah and the invasion and the failure of their invasion. So in, in both Kings and Isaiah, the invasion is described and the Assyrians surround Jerusalem but never capture it. And we get that same story in the Assyrian text, although each of them spin it. So for the Israelites, they, they surround Jerusalem, but they fail to capture Jerusalem because God is with us. Forget the fact that they burned all the cities except Jerusalem. In the Assyrian version, they burn all the cities except Jerusalem. They surround Jerusalem, punish Jerusalem, and then leave. But never, they, 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 they handily leave out the fact that they failed to capture the city of Jerusalem. So you can, this is a historical event. The question is how much of this buildup is also historical, and I think it is. So that means that this brazen serpent is a real thing. I think we've put it in the realm of a historical artifact. Traditionally, it was made by Moses. That we cannot establish. What we can establish is there was a serpent of some sort made out of bronze that sat in the temple, and people were worshiping it and burning incense to it. And use the same words for bronze? Yes, serpent. yes. So he's referring to that object. Specifically, he says Moses made it. So we know he's referring to the same object. It's a serpent of bronze on a pole that Moses made using the same term. So he removed the high places, broke down the pillars, and cut down the sacred pole, the Asherah. So Asherah worship was the worship of a goddess who was seen as the wife of the Israelite god of Jehovah. And she was worshipped on a sacred pole. And of course, the biblical authors do not like this, the later biblical authors. But this was an, uh, uh, an original part of Israelite worship. Later Israelites did not agree with this idea. They thought it was bad. And they had to talk the other Israelites who had these older folk traditions out of doing this sort of thing. Because this is this was the, origi- the religion of their ancestors, that they worshipped these these polytheistic gods. So he cut down the Asherah. Now notice, Asherah is a pole representing a tree and a female deity. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent. What is that? It's a snake on a pole that the Israelites, that Moses made, for until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it, and it was called Nehushtan. Nehushtan. Nahushtan. This is also a a reference to uh, uh, the same wordplay, Nahash, Nehoshet, uh, the the serpent of bronze or the bronze pole. (coughs) What's happening? I don't know. I don't think anyone knows for sure, but I would suspect that there were cult objects, one representing Asherah, one representing some other deity, maybe Israelite, Israel himself, the God of Israel, or maybe a different pagan deity. It's not clear. And they were both in the temple. They were both poles. They were both kind of representations of these, of, of these deities, and people would burn incense to them, and this was part of original Israelite worship. What is and, and by the time of Hezekiah, the tradition had been made that this, this serpent uh, was made by Moses. And my guess is people were going there t- and burning incense to it to be healed. Whether it was really made by Moses or whether it was something else that later someone decided must have been made by Moses is unclear. But this was some original part of ancient Israelite worship, both the Asher worship and the bronze serpent worship. So let's try to make sense of that. What is the meaning of serpents in the ancient Near East? Well, um, according to the Garden of Eden story, serpents are cursed to go on their belly. Um, <clears throat> they are uh, connected to death, poison, danger, and wilderness because you find them out in the wilderness and when they bite you, you die. Makes sense. But they're also associated with healing and resurrection. And the reason for this is serpents shed their skin. And when they shed their skin, they, just before they shed their skin, they look really old and, and beat up and run down. And they shed their skin and suddenly they're young again. And so there was this idea that serpents represent both rejuvenation, rebirth, and eternal youth. Uh, we find serpents associated with eternal youth in the Gilgamesh epic, for example. Uh, they also guard eternal youth and prevent humans from achieving eternal youth. Remember, the serpent takes the, the plant of, that Gilgamesh finds and takes it down into the water. And so the serpent gets to have eternal youth and shed its skin and live forever. And Gilgamesh doesn't get to. Um, uh, they are also shown as temple guardians. We'll call them the seraphim. And we'll show them in ancient Egyptian sources. And then we'll talk about them in Israelite sources. This is the uh, winged, uh, glowing golden bronze serpents from Egypt, protecting the cartouche of the pharaoh. Uh, we see this in the tomb of Nefertiti, or ne- sorry, Nefertari, uh, the wife of Ramses. Uh, again, we have uh, a serpent 
with wings uh, guarding the path. So these are these are Egyptian symbols of guardian and, and being and guardians. Uh, they also show up on the crown of the you know, Egyptian pharaoh has on the top of his crown right here that that serpent symbol of. Do you remember how you? Uh, which one is, uh, the serpent is one of the two, either upper or lower Egypt, and I, my brain just spaced it. I used to know this off the top of my head, and now it's been 15 years, and I can't remember. I apologize, but uh, the serpent is a representation of either upper or lower Egypt, and so the pharaoh has two crowns, one representing upper Egypt, one representing lower Egypt, and one of them has a serpent on it. And again, the serpent is the symbol of the guardian of upper or lower Egypt, whichever it is. My favorite example of the serpent, though, is from the tale of the shipwrecked sailor. Uh, this is the first uh, sea, sea shanty uh, slash tall tale, fisherman's tale sort of thing. Uh, and, so, and it's this tall tale. And it's very clearly a tall tale because it starts out with, with you know, a, a, a sailor talking to his captain. And his captain is worried that Pharaoh's going to be mad at him. And the sailor says, don't worry. Good things always happen. Let me tell you a story. And he tells this fantastic story about how once he was shipwrecked and everyone died but him and he was washed up on an island. And while he's on this island, he was afraid, but the island was so full of great figs, trees, it was a garden of Eden and everything is, it was wonderful. And he found all this incense and all this wealth and glory. And suddenly a massive, the ground shook and this massive serpent came curdling through the thing and it was made out, it was, its skin was gold, blue and it had gold inlay. By the way, the way he describes this is exactly like the death mask of a pharaoh. And in other words, it is, it is a god. This is how gods are portrayed in ancient Egypt. So the, the serpent itself is a deity and it's covered in gold and, and, and lapis lazuli gems and he falls on his face and the serpent says, tell me what you're doing here or I will murder you. And he says, well, I was shipwrecked. I'm going to die. Please don't hurt me. And he says, I won't hurt you. You will do well. In fact, a ship will come and rescue you in a few days. Stay here for a few days and revel in the beauty of my island. In a few days, you'll be saved and you'll go back to your home and your family and you'll be better than me because I am the last of my kind. A star fell from heaven and killed my wife and kids and I am the last deity here. All of my family is gone, but you get to go home to your family. And just like he said, a ship came and brought him home and he was able to bring incense and gold and in and, and return in triumph and spoke to Pharaoh and showed him all the gold he had brought in triumph and the Pharaoh was really happy. And, and the captain looks at this man who told him this story and he says, how does this help me? Because you brought all this great stuff home and I'm going to go empty handed. That's why Pharaoh's mad at me. And he basically tells him to go shove off because it doesn't help him at all. He's still depressed. And that's how the story ends. It's a great tall tale story, but I love the description of the serpent. The serpent is the guardian of the island of treasure that this shipwrecked sailor finds. And he says, I'm going to come back and bring back all this gold. He says, you won't be able to take what you can. The island will sink into the sea and you'll never find it again. It's a magical, mystical island. It's a great tall tale. By the way, I couldn't resist. I asked uh, Bing Chat to draw me a picture of the serpent uh, guardian from the tale of the shipwrecked sailor from ancient Egypt because I couldn't find a good picture online. So I, I tried to make one with AI. Uh, and the serpent should be made of gold and have blue skin and a false beard like a pharaoh. The beard isn't really the pharaoh's false beard, but it tried. This is pretty good. I was, I was fairly impressed. Um, illustration from nowhere. Okay, so those are stories from ancient Egypt. We also have them from, from Greece. Um, this is uh, escape, uh, I don't know how to say these Greek words, Aesculapius. Um, it is the same symbol we see on, uh, if you go to hospitals, you'll see this serpent on a pole often. Uh, and it's a symbol of healing because he had this, uh, this magic staff, which would bring life, eternal life. And in fact, Zeus has to kill him. This is very much like Gilgamesh, uh, lest uh, eternal life be given to man. And God doesn't want man to have eternal life. So God, uh, uh, Zeus, stops Asclepius. Now, this is very much like the Gilgamesh story. It is very much like the Garden of Eden story, where the snake takes eternal life from mankind. And here, God takes eternal life from Asclepius, but his staff supposedly has the power to heal, and it was part of a healing cult in the ancient near ancient Greece. Uh, today we have the caduceus, also sometimes shows up on, on medical uh, symbols and license, but it's actually sort of a mistake. This symbol, or this staff, was, was more of a, a symbol of, uh, of mercury and messengers. It's the winged serpent. Notice the winged serpent. I think that's interesting. But here's this winged serpent. It also supposedly had the power to resurrect, but it was not the, the primary healing staff. That's this one. Uh, so we sometimes see it, the, um, the caduce, caduceus drawn uh, in, as symbols of, of medicine and, and doctors, but it's, it's sort of a, a mistake. It's, they've got the wrong staff. But either way, we've got this winged serpent that's interesting. All right. 
<clears throat> What's really fun is when we get to Isaiah chapter 6. And in Isaiah chapter 6, he mentions seraphim. He's the only place those show up. But before we had the seraph serpents, the fiery serpents, and suddenly we have fiery beings, seraphim. And for the first time, they get wings. You'll notice wings was not mentioned in numbers anywhere, but suddenly when we get to Isaiah, the fiery beings have wings, although he never says they're snakes, at least not in Isaiah chapter 6. And what happens here is uh, Isaiah is presented with the throne of God, the Ark of the Covenant. And on the Ark of the Covenant are two cherubim, two winged creatures, normally winged bulls. But Isaiah talks about seeing seraphim in heaven, fiery beings, and he describes them as having six wings. With twain they covered their face, with twain they covered their feet, and with twain they did fly. And so these are the guardians surrounding God's throne. Again, from uh, his reference to seraph, He's, again, referring fiery. So it could just be that he's trying to talk about fiery things. God's throne is this beautiful, fiery, um, glorious place. But it also does seem to have, it's, it almost sounds like it has a connection to uh, the, the snakes in the wilderness because they are also seraph. That could be a coincidence. But we have these Egyptian snake guardians of God's throne, which are fiery. Uh, Again, we're stretching a little bit because there's no reference to the snakes, and they have faces to be cover and feet to cover, which makes them sort of not sound snake-like, but there is no reference to what they do look like, so we don't know. But Isaiah also gives us, quote, the fiery flying serpents in both Isaiah 14 and Isaiah 30. So the only other time Isaiah uses this term seraph, not the only time, but, but when Isaiah also uses this term seraph, in this case to refer not to guardians, but to God's punishing. In both cases, these are fiery flying serpents that punish the people. So he also does talk about fiery serpents, but he adds flying into the mix. And though that's in Isaiah 14, 29, and 36. These are Isaiah's fiery flying serpents. So again, Isaiah here is connecting, connecting uh, this seraph term with serpents. Um, and of course, the final reference is the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve. Uh, you'll notice here, I especially like Michelangelo's rendition here, the serpent is wound around a tree. Uh, of course, it's the connection here is between the serpent and the tree of knowledge of good and evil who gives the fruit to Eve. I can't help but see a connection here. In fact, uh, one way to do this and to view this story is that these traditions were uh, in some ways, and the connection of the snake wrapped around a pole uh, as a tree in the temple, connected with Asherah, who's also a tree and a female deity, a tree deity that's female, connecting like Eve and the serpent. It's possible that what's happening is these things that were worshipped that people didn't think were part of proper worship were then demonized. And then they were pushed back in time. And the Garden of Eden story, you could, again, I'm, I'm, this, is, this is a conjecture, but it is certainly possible that the Garden of Eden story itself is, is a reference, a demonization of earlier forms of worship in the temple, referencing the tree and the, and, um, the snake and the pole. Um, but either way, we do have this serpent snake pole, and we also have the snake associated with the loss of eternal life, exactly like we saw in Greek mythology, which we just showed, and exactly like we also saw in uh, in Egyptian, or sorry, in in the the Epic of Gilgamesh. Apologize. Um, okay, uh, we have one other thing going on here. Um, we talked about the serpent connection to the loss of eternal life and the serpent having eternal life, but that goes the other direction because the serpent is the symbol of, of a being that has this life, this resurrection, this rejuvenation power. It's used in healing. We talked about that in Greek tradition as well. Both of those contradictions, right, the serpent and the loss of eternal life and also the power of healing is in both of these stories. And so we have this reference in Deuteronomy. If a man commits a crime that is punishable by death, he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree. His body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him on the same day, for a hanged man is cursed by God. There's some reference of being, as being hanged is to a reference to being cursed. 
Um, it is, it is uh, likely that what that is a reference to is this lack of burial, right? Things that, that are so bad they don't even get buried are cursed. That's a curse to not, get, not even be worthy of a proper burial. And so you hang them on this tree and they don't even get to go down into the ground and be buried and return to Mother Earth. This is important because if we're trying to interpret this story, there's a couple ways to do it. Uh, Egyptian and Mesopotamian magic, healing magic, tended to involve cursing the thing that was causing the suffering. So if serpents are biting you, you take the serpent, you put it on a pole, it's hung upon a pole and it's cursed. So you curse the serpent and therefore the people are healed. This is one way to, to interpret this. And they're, my guess is they didn't have an answer, an interpretation. For them, these things have multiple meanings and, and, and weave in and out of, of their thoughts in many ways. But one of the things you can see happening here is probably this idea of cursing the serpent and thereby healing the people. And so this is a form of sympathetic magic that brings healing. We see that in healing rituals from Mesopotamia. We see it from healing rituals in Greece. And we see it in healing rituals from Egypt. So it's a very common way of, of producing healing in, in, in the ancient magic worldview of the ancient Near East. Which brings us to the New Testament use of the passage. No one has ascended into heaven. This is in the book of John, chapter 3, verse 14, through th uh, starting 13, actually, through 16. And no one has ascended into heaven except one who descended from heaven, namely the Son of Man. You notice this going up and going down? Uh, this is important because it's sort of like raising the pole up on a, on a stake. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Specifically, he's talking about the cross. So that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now is probably the most famous verse in all of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Uh, this is a serpent that brings life. A healing serpent. Only in this case it's Christ being lifted up on the cross. This idea of curse, cursing is also carried over into the New Testament. And how do they do that? Well, we have that same passage in Deuteronomy, and now look how Paul interprets it. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree, again quoting Deuteronomy. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians. So from Paul's perspective, Christ is uh, not deserving of a curse, but he takes upon a curse for our sakes. He's becoming the cursed thing. So this connects with the earlier idea of how we said this healing ritual was working. Uh, they were cursing the serpent and thereby healing uh, man. And in this case, we're cursing Jesus or he's allowing himself to be cursed, thereby removing the curse from us and bringing eternal life because serpents are this symbol of both death, they bring death, and eternal life. So we're gaining the eternal life, taking it back from the serpent, so to speak, through the atonement of Jesus. The, the, the multiple kind of uh, inter-reference and symbolism that is being pulled in here from all these different sources is quite intricate and, and impressive. And so we have the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve and eating the fruit and the serpent taking away our eternal life. We have serpents biting the people and a, a, a pole being lifted up. And then we have Christ dying on the cross uh, and, and, and being lifted up on the cross and thereby taking the curse upon himself for us. The best uh, image, I think, of this idea is the tree of life and death, a tree of death and the tree of life. Uh, it's it's uh, an early medieval uh, uh, illustrated, illuminated manuscript. And it has a single tree and on that tree is Adam's skull on the right and Christ uh, on the cross on the left. Below the tree, we see Adam uh, bemoaning the fact that he has lost eternal life. And we see Eve taking the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. She's been handed that fruit by a snake lifted up on the pole. She is passing that out as if it was a sacrament to the sinners of the world who were standing on the left hand of God. On the right hand of God, we see Mary, Mary, mother of, of Jesus, passing out the wafer of the Eucharist, uh, the, the bread of life, the manna, the, uh, the flesh of Christ, the sacrament, the Eucharist, um, the wafer to the worshipers who were kneeling before her 
and she's offering them the uh, the sacrament, the Eucharist. This one picture seems to pull in all of these symbols and puts them in one place for us um, so that we can see the, the dichotomy between the, the fall and atonement as Christians worked these stories into their mythos. It's also fun to look at the fiery flying surf serpents in the Book of Mormon. I can't help it. I've got to do this. Uh, this is First Nephi, uh, one of the first chapters in the Book of Mormon, the first chapter in the Book of Mormon. Uh, sorry, the first author, um, chapter 17, verse 41. And he, God, did straighten them in the wilderness with the rod, and they hardened their hearts. This reference, hardened their hearts, is part of Psalms. There's a, there's a psalm that talks about what happens. So Joseph Smith here is quoting the Psalms, um, who reference the story in, uh, in Egypt, or in, in, in the exodus from Egypt, where God, where the people harden their hearts and God straightens them. All these references, straightened, hardened hearts, all of it comes from Psalms. And he sent, notice, fiery flying serpents. In numbers, they're just fiery serpents. But Joseph is pulling this fiery flying serpent straight out of Isaiah. This is the sort of thing that happens when you dictate things kind of from memory. You, you, you pull things from different sources. So he's mixed the fiery flying serpents of Isaiah and pulled them down into the, uh, into the numbers fiery serpents. So he sends the fiery serpents among them, and after they were bitten, he prepared a way that they might be healed. And the labor which they had to perform was to look. Now notice, Joseph is uh, talking about a labor they had to perform. Why is he doing that? Well, because... Part of the Book of Mormon's purpose was to defend the free Methodist idea of free will against the universalist perspective on one hand and the, um, on the other hand, the Presbyterian notion of predestination. So Joseph is trying to defend this idea of free will from both predestination and universal, Unitarian Universalism. His father was a Unitarian Universalist and his pastor in Vermont was almost certainly Hosea Ballou, one of the founders of our church. And so in Joseph's own family, his two parents had taken these opposite positions. Uh, Calvinist predestination on the one hand and Unitarian Universalist on the other from his father and his mother. And Joseph is trying to bring his family together and end this conflict by bringing out this Book of Mormon, which is going to give them the real answer, which is, of course, free will Methodism, which Joseph says himself he was partial to. So what happens? Um, they had a labor. So God prepares the way. That's salvation by grace. But they had a labor they had to do, which was to look. But, now notice this, this, is very uh, <coughs> this is very fascinating. Because of the simpleness of the way or the easiness of it, there are many who perished. That is not in the text. The people perished before Moses raised the serpent, but after he raises the serpent, there's no indication that people keep dying. But in this exe uh, exegesis, people die even after the serpent is available. Why? Because the, the way was so easy that they didn't look. So they hardened their hearts from time to time, and they revile against Moses and against God. Nevertheless, we know that they were led by his matchless power into the land of promise. Joseph is very well illustrating that whole cycle we just talked about. So this is how this story is interpreted by the 1800s. This is why the Book of Mormon is a useful story to talk about, because it shows how this story enters common thinking in the early West, uh, in the, sorry, the early times of, of America, early American times. 18, 18th century, or 1800s, sorry. Uh, it's interesting. Again, we see several different points. This combination of grace and works, which is, is Joseph's calling card, um, the fiery flying serpents uh, instead of just the fiery serpents, and this idea that many died. E even after God prepared a way, they died because they just refused to look. And this is a commentary for him on people who refused to be Christians. God made this easy way to save everybody, the death of Christ, but some people just refuse to look and then they then they 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 perish, spiritually perish. Um, he has one other reference to these serpents, and this is in Alma, but it's the same idea. Behold, this is not all, these are the um, these are not the only ones who have spoken concerning the Son of God. Now, this is in the middle of a sermon on faith. So what, what Joseph is claiming here is that we know that Jesus is real because we see symbols of him in the Old Testament. And, and the people in the Old Testament spoke of Christ. That's his claim. Behold, he was spoken of by Moses when Moses said, a prophet will come after me, presumably. 
Uh, and yea, behold, his type was raised up in the wilderness, that whosoever would look upon it might live. So what he's just said is that the, the brazen serpent is a symbol of Jesus Christ, and the whole point of that whole exercise with the serpent was to, to create a story that would symbolically point people at Christ. And many did look and live, but few understood the meaning of these things. So there was, there was, there was this meaning, but it was hidden from most people. Um, this because of the hardness of their hearts. But there are many who were so hardened that they would not look. Now again, that is, a, that is not in the text at all, but this is, this is Joseph's interpretation. Many didn't look, therefore they perished. Now the reason they would not look is because they did not believe that it would heal them. Uh, so faith. Uh, lack of faith leads them to not perform the work, which leads them to not be saved. This is an expression of free will Methodism. Oh, my brethren, if you could be healed by merely casting your eyes that you might be healed, would you not behold quickly? Would you not rather harden your hearts in unbelief and be slothful that you would not cast about your eyes that you might perish? Can you imagine? You're dying of a snake bite and there's this thing right there. All you have to do is look and you just don't look. That's how stupid it is not to be a Christian. This is what he's claiming, right? Uh, so, uh, who shall come up, woe shall come upon you, but it shall not but if not so, then cast about your eyes and begin to believe on the Son of God that he will come to redeem his people and that he shall suffer and die and atone for their sins and that he shall rise again from the dead, which shall bring to pass the resurrection that all men shall stand before him to be judged at the last day according to their works. This reference to resurrection is also a part of the mythos of the brazen serpent. So that's how this is used both in the Old Testament later by Christian thinkers in, uh, in John and in Paul, in Corinthians, Galatians, and then this is how it is used in the 1800s by, uh, um, uh, in America by Joseph Smith. If you're interested in more information about the Book of Numbers, there is a great podcast, um, Pete Ruins Numbers, uh, Season 6, Episode 212 of the Bible for Normal People. Pete also has episodes on ruining Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Isaiah, and Deuteronomy, for, um, and very recently, uh, Joshua. Um, and that is it. We have finished with the book of Numbers. Uh, next time, and I don't know when that will be, but I'll try to let you know as soon as I figure it out. Next time, we will do the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy will introduce us finally, finally, to the fourth author of our, of our Pentateuch. The documentary hypothesis says there are, there are four main authors, P, E, J, and D. And D is found almost entirely in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, at least in these first, first few books. So we will introduce the book of Deuteronomy next time. We will introduce the new author, D. We'll talk about how D is different from the other sources, J, E, and P. And then we will outline the book of Deuteronomy and, and uh, begin to cover that material. And again, I don't know how many classes it'll take us to get through Deuteronomy. We may do it in one. We may do it in a couple. I don't know. Um, I'll have to look through and see how much of it we want to do and how much detail. But we'll begin the Deuter book of Deuteronomy next time, and I'll let you know when that is as soon as I know myself. Are there any questions about numbers before we quit or thoughts about the book of numbers? No? Thank you. This is terrific. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I enjoy, enjoyed doing this. Oh, so that's helpful. how these themes weave and weave in and weave out. They are for me, too. Uh, what, what attracts me to this is trying to find the sources. Uh, you know, I, uh, even the Book of Mormon is interesting in that way. Where did this come from? What's the source of this? What passage is he quoting? What passage is he paraphrasing? What, what later interpretation is he opposing back on this text? The same thing with the Book of, of, of the New Testament. How are these New Testament authors using the Old Testament? Where did they get these ideas? How did these ideas evolve to the point where they got them? Where did they come from? And then you go all the way back to the Old Testament. Why did they believe in these weird things? What in the ancient Near East made this look plausible to them? Why was this part of the ancient Near Eastern worldview that they were a part of? What was that worldview and what does that mean about the stories? How does it help us interpret the stories? This feels to me like a massive puzzle and we're missing some of the pieces and we're trying to put it all back together and understand it. And so for me, that is just this, this fascinating thing that I love to do. Uh, and, and I know that that's not what everyone is interested in, um, but I love that. And I also love sharing just enough of it with you that you can sort of see at least some of the evidence we have against inerrancy. Um, because again, I don't, I don't care if you believe in God. I don't care if you don't believe in God. I don't believe God, if there is one, minds, either way. But I believe inerrancy is problematic. 
because A, we know objectively that it's not the case. There's too much evidence against it. But B, it leads people to be unethical. It leads them to assume that God commands genocide because that's what he does in the text. And if that's what God is like and God is the ideal, that's what you should be like. And that is a very dangerous position and it makes people worse. Uh, and so there are many people who believe in the text but understand its lack of inerrancy and they're good, ethical, wonderful people. And I have, I'm not, my goal is not to talk them out of their faith. Um, but, but I do have a problem with inerrancy. And so uh, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about that. Um, and then, and then that, that belief that, that, that I believe God, if he exists, will save people regardless of their le- belief or lack of belief is, is a personal thing. That, that's, not as, 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 that's not as core to what I'm doing here, but that is my own personal belief, right? That, that if, if God only saves believers, and yet there are good people who believe and good people who don't believe, and then God fails to provide enough evidence to make people rationally want to believe, that God is also a monster, right? That is an unethical position. And so uh, if, if there is a God, I propose God loves everybody and saves people regardless of their belief or lack thereof. Otherwise, if God cared so much about belief, he would give us good reasons to believe. Uh, and so those are my two main, main kind of ideas. The first is biblical inerrancy is problematic and historically impossible. And the second is, uh, and, and, this, and again, that one is a little, this one is, is more of an opinion, whereas the first one is sort of an objective fact that I'm trying to teach about. But the other one is my opinion, uh, and that's that, that I don't know whether there's a God, um, but I don't think our belief or lack of belief is, is tied to our eventual salvation, whatever that looks like or is. So I hope that what we've shared today uh, helps you in your journey, in your life's journey, and brings you to where you, you can be and need to be and feel you can be. And I hope to see you next time. Thank you all for coming.